Good morning. It's great to be with you again. It's September. Uh, spring has arrived in full vengeance in, in Cape Town, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, September is the weakest month historically uh, from an equity market perspective. And we have adjusted our portfolio. We have reduced our equity exposure, but for other reasons, which I will get into later in the, in the presentation. Today, we also have Nikita Hadskins, one of our portfolio analysts, and she's going to be telling us about my favorite fund, the Skeleton Balance 70, but the whole range, the Skeleton Balanced range. So please uh, also look out for that uh, towards the end of the presentation. But, but first, uh, let's start off with the month in review. And August was certainly something that needs to be reviewed <laughs> in detail. Um, incredibly volatile month, but fortunately ended the month positive after all the, the volatility and, and the noise. Um, the best performance for the month was the consumer staples, uh, four value th or sorry, our four thematic uh, funds, consumer staples, healthcare, uh, what used to be the fourth, well, it still is the fourth industrial revolution, but we have changed that benchmark to the NASDAQ. So I've got there the NASDAQ 100 and then the FANG.AI benchmark. You can see their best performing for the month is consumer staples up 3% in RAND terms. And that's despite the RAND strengthening 2% against the dollar. So a fantastic defensive positioning from uh, consumer staples. Healthcare up 0.5%. Uh, in RAND terms, which is not bad, didn't perform as well as you would expect given the volatility. And FANG.AI having the worst performance for, for the month. Fortunately, as you know, we did reduce our exposure to FANG at the beginning of July. So that did not impact our equity port portfolios. Um, but it was surprising. I mean, first, of, first of all, in August, it was driven down by the flash crash. And I'll talk about that uh, in the chart of the month. But then towards the end of the month, NVIDIA had fantastic results. NVIDIA. Nvidia's revenue doubled and they beat expectations quite significantly. And despite that, uh, the share price fell 8% on the day. So interesting there that such amazing uh, re uh, returns, such amazing results actually underwhelmed the market. And one of the reasons that we are comfortable still uh, having reduced that FANG.AI exposure in our funds. For the rest of the rest of uh, asset class is pretty positive. As you can see on the chart there, uh, the uh, flash crash in August uh, did result in an increased probability of a U.S. recession being priced into by, by the markets. So that saw um, an increased probability of U.S. rate cuts, and that led to the dollar weakening. And the dollar weakening and the lower U.S. bond yields helped our bonds do well. So you can see our bonds up 2.4%, uh, SA bonds up 2.4%, but global property also rallied 2.2%. South African property rallied very strongly, um, and obviously the RAND strengthened 2% against the dollar. So some big implications, all driven by that flash crash uh, in early August. Uh, so let's look at that quickly just to, well, we'll look at that a phenomenal return and that drove it to the number one fund over one year over 12 months signia listed property index fund up 37.3 percent dethroning the fang.ai fund which has been number one for a long time uh, and pushing the Berkshire hathaway fund to third place over 12 months 21.4 percent as you can see there over one month uh, Berkshire hathaway having a decent return in fact quite quite a phenomenal return given in, given the rand strength of two percent over the month um, and that up 4.2 percent in rands even even higher in, in dollars Box Hathaway doing some interesting uh, further adjustments during the month. They sold uh, some shares, took profit on some of the, the underlying holdings. And that that fund or that, that company, I suppose, Box Hathaway company, now has a quarter of its um, market cap in cash. So very defensively positioned at the moment, Box Hathaway sitting with a huge cash pile of a quarter of, of the market cap. So we'll be watching that quite closely to see what happens. Uh, as for the rest of the funds, uh, the fourth and fifth fund for the one month Signia All Bond Fund, um, sorry, third and fourth over, over one month and fourth and fifth over 12 months, the, the bond funds in South Africa are doing very nicely. I mean, they started to perform well with other emerging market funds as the dollar weakened. We were further helped by our government of national unity. And then as interest rates uh, projections fell further uh, after the flash crash, they did even better this month, up another 3% taking the cumulative 12-month performance of those bond funds to nearly 20%, an incredible performance from, from those, those 
bond funds. You can see that we have the enhanced bond fund and the all bond fund. Signet has two bond funds. Um, the enhanced bond fund over 12 months, nearly a percent ahead of the, uh, the index bond fund, which is fantastic. And that's uh, all through the addition of very low risk credit. So our enhanced bond fund is passive. It doesn't take on any duration positions. It doesn't go overweight duration. It doesn't go underweight duration. So it doesn't take any interest rate bets. It doesn't, it doesn't say, oh, we think that the Saab is going to cut three uh, times this year and the market's only pricing in four cuts. So we're going to you know, position accordingly. It doesn't do that. It sits neutral uh, on the, the duration basis, but it does invest in credit, uh, some government guaranteed credit, uh, some other high rated credit, and you get a very decent return uh, of an extra nearly 1% in, in, uh, over, over the last 12 months. And that fund doing incredibly well on a relative basis as well. So those of you who are looking for bond funds, have a look at our enhanced all bond fund. It is unique in the market. There's no other fund I'm aware of that doesn't take duration risk um, and sits neutral on, on the, the bond duration while taking credit risk. Very exciting fund. Um, Two other housekeeping things to announce while we're looking at the funds. As of the 31st of July, the fourth industrial revolution ETF is now an actively managed ETF. And as of the 6th of August, the health innovation ETF is now also an actively managed ETF. And that joins the FANG.AI, uh, which is also an actively managed ETF. So in our three thematic ETFs, all three of them are actively managed which means that they all have our best view. So as you know, we have we have those three themes in the unit trust, which has always been active. And those unit trusts have always had our best view. The ETFs have been passive, uh, and we've been able to convert those uh, passive ETFs to actively managed ETFs, which allow us to align the ETF positioning to the unit trust positioning. So now from your perspective, you can be indifferent. You can choose to either invest in our actively managed ETF, or you can choose to invest in our unit trust. You know, you're going to get a very, very, very similar positioning uh, between the two. And it's just, you can choose which wrapper works best for you. And uh, so it's very nice that, that those changes have all been implemented. Uh, all three of our thematic uh, ETFs now active. Okay, so that's the Signia fund performance for the month. Let's look at the chart of the month. Now, the hero of the month was Mr. Uchida, uh, the deputy governor of the Bank of Japan. And when the flash crash happened and Japanese equities fell 20%, he came out uh, to save the day and said the bank will not raise its policy interest rates when financial and capital markets are unstable, as you can see in his tweet. And that really helped um, in a great way to, to, to unwind the flash crash and help markets recover. So let's talk about the flash crash. So August was a roller coaster. As I said, Japanese equities were down 20% at one point. Um, so what happened? Well, the carry trade unwound. So what is the carry trade? The carry trade is just another terminology for a geared trade. Basically, it's, this, it's uh, when you borrow to invest. Um, so it's two sides of the same coin. The coin is your carry trade. On the one side of the coin, you have your borrow. On the other side of the coin, you, you have your invest investment. Now, people have the carry trade uh, in place uh, in various different guises, different borrowers, different, different investments. But what happened in August was quite unique in that there was bad news um, on the carry side, on the borrower side of that coin, and there was bad news on the investment side. And as the bad news happened, it forced the one leg to unwind, and that pressure forced the other leg to unwind, and then there was bad news on that leg, and that forced that leg to unwind, which then forced the other leg to unwind. So you had the circular reference of a very unique situation with both legs having bad news on almost exactly the same time, and that leading to a circular reference or a downward spiral and selling and forced selling. Goldman Sachs estimate that systematic funds, those are the funds that, that rely heavily on gearing um, and uh, are very sensitive to volatility, sold the most or well, the dollar value of equities in four years in the first week of August, a massive unwind. So what happened? Well, so the market was very heavily positioned, um, borrowing from the yen and investing in US tech. Now, borrowing from the yen worked very well, firstly, because uh, the interest rates in, in uh, Japan were zero, basically. So you could borrow at zero. And then the yen has been weakening steadily over the last few years. 
So not only were you paying nothing in interest rates, but you were actually making money on your borrow uh, as the yen weakened. Imagine that. It's like you, 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 you've got a, a mortgage on your house, which costs nothing. And then you're actually making money on that mortgage um, uh, through capital appreciation as, as the, the yen weakens. So that, that worked really well. Um, the other leg was invested in U.S. tech, which also worked very well. As you know, U.S. technology uh, performance from the NASDAQ uh, has been fantastic over, over the last two years, as has the FANG.AI stocks. So both legs of the, the carry trade are working beautifully. And then we had the two uh, black swan events on almost the same, same time. The first was a surprise rate hike by the Bank of Japan. They raised rates from 10 basis points to 25 basis points. Uh, a lot more than the market was, was expecting. And then on top of that, they intervened in the, the, the currency into the yen and they bought currency and that caused the yen to appreciate incredibly strong. Uh, the, the yen appreciated more than 10% uh, in, in a day or two. And you can see from the chart on the right, the blue line is the, the yen carry index showing that strengthening in the yen. But at the same time, we had... Um, a very important number that everyone watches in the US, which is non-farm payrolls. Uh, it's a monthly number and very important to try and gauge what's happening to the employment sector in the US because people are very concerned that employment is weakening and the weakening employment is going to cause a recession. So that number came out um, and it was incredibly weak, far weaker than expected. It was distorted by Hurricane Beryl, um, but people didn't look at the distortion. They just saw this, this, this dreadful number come out of the U.S. And so they, they sold um, U.S. technology stocks. So we had people unwinding their borrow because the, the, the yen was strengthening. And we had people selling um, tech stocks because the U.S. was weak. And both of them were causing the other one to, to, to unwind because they, they, they were so linked in the carry trade. And we had this, this massive... Um, massive fall in, in in August. But the markets have recovered. Uh, the yen hasn't, as you can see on the chart on the right, the yen is still quite strong, whereas technology stocks have recovered and all markets have recovered, as I, as I showed. Um, but what's happened is that the, the, these systematic funds, they've, they've started buying again, but they've switched uh, funding. They're, they're no, no longer borrowing in uh, yen because they think that the yen will strengthen further as the Bank of Japan raises rates further. So they're now borrowing in uh, ch primarily the Chinese yuan because China is looking very weak and they think that the currency will, 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 will weaken um, and some of them have moved to the dollar because uh, that then re removes your your uh, your currency risk and then you're just borrowing in dollars and investing in dollars and hoping that that, that technology stocks will, will rally or whatever they choose to, to invest. But um, that has revived, that carry trade has revived. And it's quite incredible. Um, it, it, at the end of the month, markets are up. It feels like nothing ever happened. But uh, those first few days of August was <laughs> was uh, quite uh, quite uh, terrifying, uh, just seeing how quickly everything un unraveled and how fast those Japanese stocks uh, sold down. I mean, you know, more than twenty percent in in a couple of couple of uh, hours or days. Uh, so things have stabilized, but it is important to note that financial gearing uh, today is you know, far exceeds um, a gearing on on physical assets and. In fact, when it comes to talking about currencies, and um, people used to look at uh, the trade account, you know, how much you're importing and how much you're exporting. And if you're if you were importing more than you're exporting, and you had a current your trade account deficit, well, then they would say, well, then your your currency needs to weaken because you're importing too much, and and vice versa. These days, the trade account means nothing for the currency movement because the amount of the financial gearing that is that happens on currencies like the yen for this carry trade. Uh, completely eclipses the fundamental uh, trades. So financial gearing is 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 so important these days that that the, some of the fundamentals are, are almost irrelevant. Uh, and right now, with volatility low, things are okay. But if volatility picks up and these these this financial gearing has to unwind, well, then we can see some some quite big volatility in the future. So um, yeah, it's definitely something to to watch, particularly because. September is uh, traditionally the, the most volatile, not traditionally, historically, has been the most volatile month um, over the last 50 years uh, on, on, on average. So we'll be watching that quite closely. Okay, moving on to the US. Yes, you can. Oh, we have to love Obama. He is absolutely awesome. He uh, has the second highest Twitter follower, what followings after 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 Elon Musk, 
um, and certainly someone that everyone re respects. And as you can see here, he has uh, endorsed uh, Harris uh, and updating his own slogan of uh, yes, <laughs> yes, you can to yes, she can. So, so uh, fantastic support there. Harris also unveiled her own economic policies this month. Uh, and one of the major ones is that she wants to raise the US corporate tax rate to 28%, certainly below the 35% um, before uh, Trump put in his uh, tax policies, bringing them down to, to 21, but definitely higher than, than what Trump uh, is going to do. And generally, Harris is seen as worse for equities than Trump. Uh, under Harris, we are expecting higher taxes and higher regulation, which are both bad for equities. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Harris is probably better for global equities because uh, she will continue the democratic uh, view or Democrats view of uh, seeing the, the world as, as one basket and, and more of a team player, whereas as Trump is focused purely on making the US uh, great again, uh, as, as we all know. The, um, but I think right now the most important thing is that the race is too, call, too, too close to call. So we, we'll be watching the presidential election on the 10th of September, so please keep an eye out for that. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch the first presidential debate between Harris and Trump. And I think most likely that we are going to see a split uh, uh, House and, and Senate and Congress, uh, which means that whoever is president, there's going to be less impactful decisions being made um, as, as a much more balanced uh, presidential powers will, will be in place. But still, important to, to watch. Uh, so while the US uncertainty has calmed a little bit, global uncertainty continues to rise. And uh, a bar of gold is now worth more than a million dollars for the first time. I mean, that's just something that's, that's quite incredible. A bar of gold. What, 12 kilograms you can hold that in your hand you can you can you can curl 12 kilograms or well, most of you can probably curl 12 kilograms don't know if i can but still you can hold 12 kilograms in your hand it's worth nearly 20 million rand million dollars it's just incredible it, it just makes the, our money seem almost almost worthless it is it is scary that you can hold so much money in the palm of your, palm of your hand Anyway, the price of gold has reached an all-time high, uh, over a, a million, million dollars for, for a bar, and that's been supported by the dovish Fed. So we had uh, Fed Chair Jeremy Powell. Uh, he came out at Jackson Hole uh, and was very dovish and confirmed, basically, that there will be a, an interest rate cut in September. Uh, we don't think that it's going to be... Um, 25, uh, 50 basis points, like the market is suggesting. We think it's going to be closer to 25 basis points. And the reason for that is that although inflation continues to fall, and for the fourth consecutive month, inflation has surprised the downside, uh, we think that inflation is going to be sticky from this point on. Um, super core inflation, which is caused for services, ex shelter, and shelter inflation both re accelerated uh, in July. And at the same time, growth is uh, it, although growth is slowing we think growth is slowing to trend um why do we think growth is going to slow to trend well the chart on the right i think is very very interesting and a, a lot of people in the market are concerned that we're heading towards a recession and that makes sense if you look at the bottom panel it shows unemployment and the white vertical bars show the recessions um you know roughly spaced uh, nearly every decade over the, over the last uh, three decades um, and on the bottom panel, you can see that the unemployment rate definitely, uh, as it starts ticking up, you, you move into recession uh, shortly afterwards. And right now, uh, the unemployment rate has started to pick up. So based on the bottom panel, definitely unemployment is picking up. You know, we've all heard about the SARM rule. You would think that uh, that would be a cause for a recession in the US. But uh, we showed last month that in previous uh, uh, recessions, the unemployment was actually rising, whereas employment is still positive in the moment. And now, if you look at the top panel, it talks about financial financial stress in the US. Uh, this is an indicator from the Kansas uh, Fed, very interesting, uh, com combined indicator of a number of, of different uh, variables. And you can see there how in every previous recession, so looking at, again, those white vertical bar bars, the savings and loan crisis, the EM crisis and dot com, dot com collapse, the great financial crisis, uh, the COVID pandemic, in each of those uh, previous recessions, financial stress in the US was elevated, it was above zero. But right now, um, financial stress in the US is almost at all-time lows. 
and it's fallen quite significantly since we had that regional banking crisis um, in, in, in the US uh, 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 two years ago. So that gives us confidence that uh, because stress is low, because monetary conditions are easy, that uh, we're not going to see a, a recession in the US uh, this year. And that's also confirmed by the fact that uh, the, the Q2 Fed senior loan officer opinion survey shows that bank lending is actually loosening, it's not tightening, and consumers are demanding more, more bank lending, they're borrowing more than, than they were. So both uh, on the consumption side and the supply side, there's more available credit and more borrowing, which means that there's, there's more growth uh, happening in the US. So we remain overweight the US, we remain overweight, overweight equities. We do think that um, the probability of a recession is overstated in the US. So right now, the US is pricing in 200 basis points or 2% of interest rate cuts over the next 12 months. Um, and that's because there are some people in the market pricing in a recession. So that's a probably weighted, the market obviously shows, you know, a probability weighted distribution of what everyone's thinking. And those who are expecting a, a recession, if, you know, if there's a recession, rates would be cut three or 4%. Um, so that, that view is bringing down that overall curve. So I, I do believe that once uh, markets once again believe there is no recession that 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 will that will even out and, and that's why despite the fed being so dovish at jackson hole and that uh, powell was very dovish he said things like conditions are now less tight than just before the pandemic he said it is unlikely that, that the labor market will be a source of elevated inflationary pressures um, and he said uh, that the fed does not seek or welcome further cooling in labor market conditions so, so very much focused on the dual mandate of the employment side over the inflation side. And that understandably has got um, many, many market participants for, forecasting 50 basis points uh, cut in September, whereas we think it's 25. Regardless, if, if there is 50 basis points, that works even better for our, of our view of being overweight the US and overweight equity, US equities. Um, but we think at 25 basis points uh, is probably all that the market will get. And there may be a little bit of disappointment uh, when that happens. So US, despite the flash crash, despite the fact that the markets are pricing in a strong probability of recession, we think uh, is slowing to trend and is still uh, resilient. Then moving on to China, uh, and we have a quote here by uh, Tim Cook, the CEO, CEO of Apple. And basically, uh, the CEO of the largest company in the world in terms of market, capitaliz market capitalization is making it very clear that China is not something that can be ignored or easily replaced. And he says, there's no supply chain in the world that's more critical to us than China. And that is very, very true. So yes, well, we've seen because of uh, the trade war in the, in the US, because of tariffs, we've seen a big move towards friendshoring and onshoring, which has forced China to move some of their production out of uh, mainland China and into other emerging markets. And there have been many beneficial India value add is more than 10 times. I mean, that's just incredible. It's more than 10 times the next largest emerging market, which is India. And even far uh, larger than the, the smaller emerging markets. Um, and China's manufacturing advantages are very di difficult to replicate, as Tim Cook points out. Uh, he talks to their low logistics costs, the China's access to advanced technology, uh, China's skilled labor pool. So from a manufacturing perspective, yes, we're seeing friendshoring, yes, we're seeing onshoring, but China's not gonna be replaced over overnight. You, just, you can't start just ignoring China because you know, there are risks of, of, of trade wars. Uh, not only from a manufacturing perspective, but China is also very important from, from a commodity perspective. So in response to US-led controls on the sales of advanced chips, which banned chip exports around the world and to China, or at least advanced chip exports uh, from Taiwan and from, from the Netherlands uh, and Japan uh, into China, uh, as a result, China put their own <laughs> Uh, tit for tat export controls on their exports of germanium and gallium, which are used for semiconductor applications. So you can't make the chips without germanium and uh, gallium. Now, China produces 98% of the world supply of, of gallium and 60% of the world supply of germanium. So that's led to a shortage in, in those two minerals, and that's led to the pricing um, more than doubling 
in in Europe over the, over the last last year. So, uh, you know, we do believe that with the importance of China, that although there are going to be trade trade wars and tariffs, uh, that realistically the world is still incredibly integrated, and I don't think that any politician is going to be uh, spiteful or so spiteful dumb enough to to cut off their nose to spite their faces because yes they may they may do saber rattling and yes they may talk about all sorts of things while they're trying to win an election but once they've won the election they need the economy to keep growing and if you start uh, not uh, you're running out of supply of key minerals to produce your own chips in the US, well, uh, things are going to grind to a halt like we saw in COVID. So, uh, you know, our volatility is going to continue, um, but uh, I think there's a good chance that uh, that a lot of this is more saber rattling than, than, than actual um, tariffs that we'll see put in place. And particularly because it's more likely to see a split Congress in the US and, and less likely to see uh, huge uh, changes in, in their tariffs. That said, China is very important. Uh, but we remain underway China it's because their domestic economy is still stuck in the doldrums because of their property uh, bubble, which, which burst. New loans to the real economy in China contracted for the first time in 19 years. Uh, that's not a good sign. Uh, and you can see on the chart on the right, total, total social financing impulse. Uh, the blue line is excluding local bonds. The green line is including local bonds. Uh, and that is negative. Basically, uh, things aren't happening in China. They're stuck. Um, they, they aren't in a recession, but they're stuck stagnating right on that recessionary line, uh, are very close to, to, to uh, contracting growth, um, but just above, uh, barely positive. Uh, and they can't get out of that without uh, some sort of bazooka policy um, response to, to turn around domestic consumption. And that needs domestic confidence to turn around. And right now, there is just no domestic confidence on the ground. Um, you know, the various yeah. strategists that have visited China uh, recently uh, are, are just, um, and even local Chinese strategists are saying there's the, the consumer is not willing to spend. They've got the highest cash allocations um, over the last 20 years. Uh, they are holding onto that cash. They don't want to spend it. Um, because they are worried about the future, they're worried about low growth, they're worried about losing their jobs. Um, so right now, uh, Chinese consumer confidence is keeping Chinese growth uh, and, uh, and uh, an expansion level. Uh, and China is still very dependent on uh, exports, and uh, you know, that will slow as uh, the US slows, even though it's only slowing to, slowing, slowing to trend, it is slowing. Okay, so still positive the US, no change there, still underweight China, uh, no change there, still overweight equities, no change there, although we, well, I'll talk about it later in positioning, we have reduced our overweight um, to, to, to equities. Uh, that's because we do think that the Fed's only going to raise rates 25 basis points in September, and that's likely to lead to a, um, a disappointment. And because we think that uh, um, the rather surprising results around or, or the market reaction around NVIDIA talks to the market sort of being a little bit tired of the, the AI uh, rally. I mean, NVIDIA beat ex expectations. NVIDIA had fantastic results and they, and they beat expectations. So they were even more, more fantastic than the market was expecting and it still fell at 8%. And I think that's a, a signal that uh, the AI rally may, may have, uh, may, may start to plateau. Not, not, we're not strategically, uh, long, uh, we do think that that AI is is the productivity boost that the market needs over or the economies need over the next decade. But I think in the in the short term, we're going to see some plateauing happening there of those stocks, as signaled by Nvidia. Uh, so with uh, slowing US US to trend and AI plateauing and possible disappointment by the Fed, we have reduced our overweight uh, to equities um, slightly. Okay, um, let's move on to oil. Bring down interest rates and lower the cost of energy. We will drill, baby, drill. I love that. Trump is going to drill. Uh, and Trump is a firm believer that the best way to reduce inflation is not to push up interest rates, um, but is to increase the supply of oil and get the cost of energy down, which makes perfect sense. Um, surprisingly, though, 
uh, U.S. oil um, has hit its peak production under Biden. U.S. oil production is at an all-time high, and that's happened under Biden, not not under under Trump. Certainly, if Trump wins, we likely to see that continue. A lot more drilling, drill baby drill, is going to happen in in the U.S. Um, Harris, on on the other hand, um, seems to be more focused on renewables, uh, and that's certainly one of the big pl plays. That that uh, if you look at at bark baskets of stocks have been set up that you can invest in if you think Trump's going to win versus baskets of stocks if you think Harris is going to win. Um, uh, Trump's stocks are certainly to be more focused on U.S. local manufacturing and U.S. Uh, small, val small value stocks, whereas Harris is very much focused on renewable stocks. So she has a very strong focus on renewables. And, she, and Harris has been endorsed by the Green New Deal Network, which Biden wasn't. So I think we will, again, see a lot more regulation come through under Harris and particularly regulation focused on, um, on climate change. Uh, and that may see U.S. oil production uh, plateau uh, or at least fall relative to Trump, where it's it's going to continue. Certainly, oil prices uh, are moving sideways, stuck around eighty eighty dollars a barrel. One of the reasons for that is for the for the first time ever last year, more than forty percent of the planet's electricity was generated from zero carbon sources, which is fantastic. And I know we are well behind our targets in terms of zero carbon emissions. But to at least achieve forty percent of the plants electricity from from zero carbon sources is is great, and that is help, that is putting um, a cap on oil prices. But the other reason for uh, oil prices being uh, stuck and moving sideways is that all three energy agencies, OPEC, EIA, and IEA, and uh, just uh, for those who are interested, OPEC is obviously the organiz organization of petroleum exporting countries. EIA is the Energy Information Administration, and IEA is the, the, the International Energy Agency. So all three global energy agencies have downgraded their global oil demand forecast for 2024. And you can see top panel on the right-hand chart in blue, a global uh, oil and liquids consumption has is, is basically zero year on year, um, not moving anywhere. Uh, and that is mostly because of weak demand, and particularly China. China uh, apparently it's, it seems to have been have hit peak oil. Uh, Chinese oil imports have, have fallen. They are well ahead of their zero carbon initiatives, six years ahead in terms of meeting that target, uh, uh, and have a, had an incredible exponential growth in their renewable energy, energy supplies. So Chinese oil demand is down. Overall, global oil demand is down, and that's one of the reasons that oil has moved sideways, despite the fact uh, people would have thought, or I certainly would have thought, that oil price would be at least $10 higher because of the increased uh, political risk in the Middle East. And that 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 doesn't seem to be dying down anytime soon. In fact, it seems to be escalating. And yet oil will just move, move sideways. Not only that, but we've had OPEC plus production cuts. I mean, they've taken $2 million, uh, two, you know, two, 2 million barrels a day out of the market um, voluntarily. And we've had the surprise uh, supply disruption from OPEC, uh, one of the OPEC partners, Libya, where they aren't producing any oil at the moment. Uh, and that's moved an additional 1 million barrels a day out of uh, the oil supply. And yet oil is still sitting below $80 a barrel uh, because of the uh, the slow demand, but also because markets are expecting uh, supply to 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 continue to to rise. Why? Well, if you look at the bottom right hand chart, uh, you can see that OPEC plus share has dropped from above sixty percent in two thousand six to below fifty percent uh, this year. And again, the top panel, the green chart, just shows the year on year. Uh, OPEC oil production. A lot of that is self-imposed. Uh, OPEC has reduced its supply voluntarily, but non-OPEC uh, partners have more than made up for that. Uh, and the US in particular, as I said, have reached uh, um, uh, all-time high oil production, as have other uh, uh, non-OPEC members. And then there's also the likelihood that OPEC is going to start reducing its production cuts uh, soon, just because they are, they, they, they get to a point where you, you can no longer afford to cut uh, production. You know, it's, it's one thing when you control the market, you cut production. Uh, yes, you, you're selling less oil, but you're selling it for a higher price. Right now, they've cut production, oil prices haven't moved, they're just losing out. And I think they realize that it no longer makes financial sense for them to, to cut uh, that supply. 
So on the one hand, oil wants to go higher because there's increased geopolitical risk um, and there's increased supply disruption in Libya. But on the other hand, you've got non-OPEC supply uh, reaching new, new highs. Uh, you've got OPEC plus uh, likely to start increasing their supply and you've got renewables also uh, reaching new highs. And that's uh, kept uh, uh, oil prices um, pretty much flat year to date, which has been good for overall inflation levels. And, and it's one of the reasons that core inflation uh, around the world uh, has surprised the downside over the last 12 months. And we do think that's going to continue to happen, that the oil price is, is unlikely to, to move out of this range-bound market, unless there's a significant event uh, that happens uh, that disrupts uh, oil, oil, oil supply. Okay, moving on to Tupot. Okay, I'm sure you're all very, very, very aware of Tupot. It went live uh, yesterday, um, well, 1st of September. Uh, and this is uh, this tweet is uh, President Ramaphosa signing Tupot into power. And he says, the new retirement system offers protection and dignity to those who need it the most to overcome financial stress. Uh, so it has been a bit of a wild ride. Uh, certainly a lot of pressure has been put on administrators to make sure that uh, they are ready to take um, those, those withdrawal notices. Certainly Signia has been working around the clock to get that uh, all in place. And we are, we are ready. Uh, we are ready for anybody who wants to uh, make a withdrawal. But let me talk a little bit more, more about that before you uh, send in your application. Um, so on two parts, uh, the South African Reserve Bank did an investigation into the impacts on GDP as a result of uh, the once-off withdrawal from two part. So why is there a once-off withdrawal? Uh, because uh, in theory, two parts, well, two parts are really three parts. You have your current vesting pot, your existing retirement savings, um, and going forward, you will have two parts. Uh, so you're, you have your current pot, which is called your, your, your vesting pot, and going forward, you have two pots, a retirement pot and a, and a savings pot. And your savings pot will have one third of your future savings, and your retirement pot will have two thirds. You can't touch your retirement pot until you retire, but your savings pot you can access once a year. Uh, and that year happens uh, to the tax year, so that's the end of February. So now as a once off, and, and remember this is only once off, as a once off, uh, the two-pot system has been uh, seeded by a 10% movement of your vesting portfolio into your savings portfolio. So, but that is capped at 30,000 Rand. So say you had um, 30,000 Rand in your time annuity, and that's your entire time and savings. 10% of that is 3,000 Rand. You could, it, the, it moves 3,000 Rand across. Um, so you can access, the, of course, there's also a limit. You can't access uh, less than 2,000 Rand. So if you if you have uh, 30,000 Rand, you'll have 3,000 Rand available. It's important to note, you're not going to have 30,000 Rand. It's only 10% it's capped at 30. So if you have if you have 30,000 Rand in your RA, 3,000 Rand will be seeded in your savings pot. Mm -hmm. Only if you have as much as 300,000 Rand will 30,000 Rand be moved into your savings pot. And if you have 400,000 Rand, well, it's still only 30,000 Rand moved, moved into your savings pot. Then there's no urgency because, you know, you have, you can take one withdrawal every, that money's there, it's been moved into your savings. You can access it whenever you want to. You can have one withdrawal every year. So you can, you can access that once up till the end of February next year. And then you can then do, uh, if you don't access it, you can then access it again once in the following tax year. Uh, so it's not like that money goes away. There's no rush. You just get to access it once every year, whatever money is in your savings pot. Now, let's look at the, the, the impact on the South African GDP. So the Saab has two scenarios. One is a high, high case scenario where they, they estimate an additional, not a total, an additional 100 billion rand will be removed from, from the savings pot in Q for this year, uh, and then a moderate uh, scenario where the estimate 40 billion will be removed. Now, the green lines show the impact to GDP as a result of that. Uh, GDP will, be, will go up 0.7% next year as a, in the high withdrawal scenario, or 0.3% in the moderate uh, withdrawal scenario. The important thing is that the long-term effect is zero. And you can see that in the chart on the right, 2026, 
uh, there's almost negligible impact. This is a once-off uh, jump, uh, once-off uh, uh, support to, to GDP growth. Now, what the Saab model doesn't discuss, and I think that's very important to discuss now, is the impacts of early withdrawals um, for mem from members when they get to retirement, when they have less uh, a smaller savings pool. And that's what I just, what I just want to end off this 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 uh, this section on, just talking about those withdrawals. So you have your savings pot has been seeded with um, ten percent of your your existing savings capped at thirty percent. You can access that once a year on a tax year, um, and that will grow by up to one third of your future contributions going forward. But that's only there. Yes, you can access you can access it once a year, but it doesn't mean you have to access it. Um, you know that money stays in that savings pot. You can access it in three years' time if if you need to. It's there for a worst case event when you are when you desperately need to access your retirement savings because retirement savings should be kept for retirement. That's that's the point. Only if you feel incredibly confident that you've got more money than you need to retire uh, should you be accessing uh, accessing that 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 pot. Uh, so I must emphasize that there's no urgency. To, to access that amount, you really shouldn't unless you desperately need it. Um, and it is it is there for retirement. Uh, the, the two part system gives you the flexibility. You no longer have to, uh, at the, the old system was you had to lose your job um, to be able to access your retirement savings. And then you could access all of it. Now that's no longer the case. Any time you want to, you can access your retirement savings only up to that third. You don't have to lose your job. Um, if things are tough, you can access it. But that doesn't mean you have to. So please, uh, you know, think, uh, be cautious uh, before uh, accessing that that thirty thousand rand or ten percent of your savings, whatever it may be, uh, um, and know there's there is no rush to to get that out. Okay, so sorry about that if I went on too long, but I, I do think it's a, a very important part. Uh, retirement savings are very important, and I'm going to talk about that uh, um, before I get onto scales and balanced. But uh, like, let's let's finish off with the, the outlook. Okay, so September is likely to see a major regime change happen to the markets. The, the, the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. 58% of uh, global savings um, are in dollars. Uh, that means that whatever happens to the dollar, whatever happens to dollar interest rates, that impacts everything. Every asset class uh, around the world and every currency is impacted by the dollar and dollar interest rates. So moving into a US uh, regime of cutting interest rates is important. So what happens? So BCA have done some research and, and they broke up the market into different um, yield curve scenarios. So they just, they said we're moving into a bull steepening scenario. So what does that mean? What is bull steepening? Well, bull, a, a bull uh, yield curve is when the yield curve moves down because you make money, because when yield curves move, yield curves move down, bond prices go up. Uh, bull steepening means that the short end goes down more than the long end goes up. But the, basically what happens is the U.S. is going to cut interest rates. Right now, markets are expecting the U.S. to cut interest rates by 2% over the next 12 months. I think it's going to be less, but let's say they cut about 2%. The long end uh, is not going to fall by as much. It's going to fall by a percent, maybe. Uh, that's a bull steepening scenario. Okay, so in a bull steepening scenario... BCA did the back testing and they said, what is the best uh, best asset class? What is the best equity sector to be in? And that's shown in the chart on the right. So the blue bars are asset classes. And you can see the third best performing asset class is US treasuries, bonds, US bonds. Um, and the other two asset classes, commodities and, and equities, pretty flat, but they don't do as well as bonds. So the, this is saying you want to be overweight bonds uh, and underweight commodities and equities. With inequities, what sector allocations should you have? Consumer staples uh, and healthcare are the two best performing. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see that the worst performing is uh, technology. Uh, and then, uh, not that we take positions in that actively, but gold uh, is does well, and you can uh, and uh, oil does poorly in this environment. So, what is what what have we done with, with our funds? Um, as I said. We have reduced our equity exposure, and partly it's because uh, of this regime uh, change. Partly it's because we think the Fed is going to disappoint, uh, and partly we, we think that uh, AI uh, is moving into sort of plateau phase. Uh, so, so we have reduced our equity exposure, 
uh, and we did that by, by reducing our FANG.AI exposure. Um, we have kept our healthcare overweights and we have kept our consumer staples overweights. So to some extent, uh, you know, we are aligning ourselves with this. We've reduced our equity slightly uh, and we are overweight consumer staples and we are overweight healthcare. However, we still have a small overweight to equities um, and we still have a, and we still neutral bonds, which doesn't dovetail to this. So you, you have to ask why, why haven't we gone overweight bonds and why haven't we, why haven't we gone underweight equities? Uh, and the reason for that is we don't think that we are at the end of the cycle. So bull steepening normally happens towards the end of an economic cycle, towards the end of an eight-year cycle. Um, and we don't think the US is heading for a recession. We think the US is slowing. We think it's slowing to trend. And we think that it's going to, the growth is going to broaden. Uh, as um, the technology st uh, stocks slow, that's going to move into broader growth across uh, other sectors. And that's why we, we become very comfortable with, with those 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 positions. And you know, further data that supports that view is preliminary global PMIs, which which came out um, uh, mid month, and they are holding steady. Global PMIs su suggest that the world, yes, it's um, it's only at trend growth. It's not expanding, but it's also not contracting. And uh, what is interesting as well, if you look into the detail of those global PMIs, um, manufacturing continues to slide. So manufacturing PMIs are recessionary, whereas services PMIs are expanding at an accelerated rate. Overall, it's pretty much flattish, but um, you know, big swing into services out of the manufacturing. Now, what does that mean? Well, emerging markets are very dependent on manufacturing. Europe is very dependent on manufacturing. Japan is very dependent on manufacturing, China. Um, so those negative uh, PMIs uh, support our view to be underweight emerging markets in Japan and Europe. Uh, and the, uh, the strong services number supports, I mean, the US is, uh, from a percentage of GDP, from a services sector versus manufacturing, the US, is, the US has amongst the highest services uh, driver in its GDP. So the US does well on a relative basis when services are strong. Uh, so that supports our view to be overweight services in the US, but it also means that we could see sticky inflation in the US because of that strong services, uh, services component. And that means that services wages uh, in the US may not fall as fast as markets are, are thinking. And that drives our higher for longer. That's why we don't think um, bond yields are going to fall as much as uh, markets are expecting in a bull case uh, uh, scenario. We think I mean, bond yields are probably going to move, 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 move flat. Uh, still bull steepening, but of a different kind. Um, so that talks to our overall positioning from a global perspective. Uh, from a South Africa perspective, we remain neutral on, on South Africa. Um, Yes, things are improving. Um, we definitely off our lows. Uh, from an energy, energy perspective, you look, if you look at the amount of energy being produced by our uh, open cycle gas turbines, that's that's way off its highs, probably down 80%, but we still are uh, relying on, on some of that emergency power as uh, creation. Rail volumes have improved, but ever so slightly off their lows and still have a long way to go. Uh, port services likewise are improving, but again, off the lows, but a long way to go before uh, it's normalized, even over on like on a two or three year basis. Likewise, if you look at interest rates, yes, interest rates um, are likely to be cut by 25 basis points this month by the Saab, supported by the US cutting, supported by lower than expected inflation, inflation now below 5% in the South Africa, which is great. But our real yields are still very high. Uh, the markets are predicting 200 basis point cuts in the US, but only 100 basis point cuts in South Africa. Uh, and that talks to the fact we have to keep yields high uh, to dampen inflation and to keep the, the, the rounds strong. Whether that's right or wrong is, a, is, a, is up for debate, but that's what the, we have quite a hawkish MPC and that's what they're likely to do. So that, all can, that will give some relief to, to South African consumers, but not that much. Uh, so again, we're seeing incremental improvements to South Africa, but still a long way off where we were two to three years, just from interest rate perspective, energy, ports, uh, railways, uh, and um, although it's moving in the right direction, it's going to take some time for us to get back to where we were, uh, and uh, yeah, that's why we stay stay neutral on uh, South Africa, and um, yeah, still still prefer uh, our global ex exposure. Uh, the other thing to, that's important to mention is geopolitical risk that has accelerated over the past month, both both Russia and Ukraine, uh, and in the Middle East, tensions have escalated. 
uh, markets haven't priced that in all. Oil market hasn't priced it in. Uh, the equity markets haven't priced it in. The flash crash that happened in, happened in August had nothing to do with, with geopolitical tensions. Uh, it was all about Bank of Japan raising rates and, and uh, climate change and big storms. So we could still see a, an event uh, on that front, either Russia, Ukraine, or Middle East, Middle East escalating and that causing uh, increased volatility. So overall, where are we? Um, uh, in July, we reduced our FANG AR exposure. Uh, in August, we reduced our equity exposure um, and uh, and did inc increase uh, some of our, our cash as a, as a result. We're still overweight equities, still neutral on, on South Africa, uh, overweight uh, healthcare and consumer staples, but that's you know, those are core positions that we've held for, for years, but we do think that they are, are, are key in the environment that we are moving into over the um, over the next few months. September, a very volatile month uh, historically, uh, and we'll have to see exactly what happens uh, there. Okay, so that's our positioning. I did say that I'd speak a bit more about savings uh, in South Africa and the importance of savings, and that leads us into skeleton balance. So Signia, as I'm sure you're all aware, has always focused on ways to keep our fees lower. Um, usually but by adding a portion of passive to the portfolio, not necessarily all passive, just some passive, but adding adding some, some passive at least to keep uh, fees down. Why? Well, we've always quoted a 2013 white paper from National Treasury, which says a regular saver who reduces the charges on their retirement account from 2.5% to 0.5% of assets annually receive a benefit 60% greater at retirement after 40 years. That's something that's, that uh, we have repeated often. Now, there was a complaint against uh, Signia's use of their quote, saying that it wasn't uh, correct. Fortunately, the Advertising Regulatory Board's Appeal Committee has up upheld our appeal, saying that we are perfectly in the right to uh, quote National Treasury, and that fees are very important when it comes to long-term savings. So this ruling validates our ongoing efforts to educate consumers about the significant impact of fees on long-term savings and reinforces our commitment to transparency and fair pricing. So uh, fees are important basically. And if you don't believe me, have a look at skeleton balance performance. It's just incredible. Skeleton balance has incredibly low fees and the fees uh, and the performance has been fantastic. And skeleton balance, the fund range, you all know my favorite fund and my, my entire retirement savings are in skeleton balance 70, but the entire fund range 40, 60, and 70 has had their 10th birthday celebration. Uh, and Nikita is going to tell you all about it. So, so thank you, Nikita. Good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Skeleton Balance range with you. As an investor in the fund, I am pleased to see my retirement savings growing in the best possible way. 10 years ago, Signia aimed to demonstrate that passive investing has a place in South Africa. Signia was also the first to launch global balanced funds with passive building blocks, specifically the skeleton balanced unit trust range. The performance table displayed here illustrates the results of the three skeleton balanced funds, 40, 60, and 70, across various time periods. As shown, the performance data clearly supports the effectiveness of passive investment strategies, consistently ranking in the top quartile for nearly every fund and period. Each fund is tailored to accommodate different risk profile and investment horizons. The 70 fund, which allocates 70% to equities, is suitable for longer investment periods or higher risk tolerance, while the 40 fund is designed for shorter periods or lower risk profiles. Additionally, we have recently introduced the Skeleton Balance Absolute Fund, which caters to investors who are more conservative 
or those with shorter investment horizons. This fund has also achieved top quartile performance over one year and since its inception. As you may have noticed, the world is becoming increasingly volatile and complex, with numerous factors making the outlook more challenging compared to the past. These factors include aging demographics, rising debt levels, deglobalization, decarbonization, and climate change. Fortunately, the skeleton balance change is designed to thrive in this type of environment as it possesses three critical success factors. Firstly, it has low fees. And we all know keeping costs low is essential for maximizing returns and achieving long-term success. Secondly, it uses proactive risk management within a holistic global framework, which is implemented through tactical asset allocation. Lastly, it provides diversified sources of return, including exposure to global thematic equities, such as FANG.AI and Health Innovation, as well as South African Enhanced Income and Credit. By addressing these critical factors, the Signia Skeleton Balance Funds uniquely positions South African investors to navigate the challenges of today's investing environment. Based on the fund's strong track record and the ongoing market volatility, I am confident in my decision to remain invested in the skeleton balance range. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. That is great. I'm also staying invested in the skeleton balance 70 fund. I think it's a fantastic a fantastic place for retirement savings. Okay, let's move on to Q and A. Uh, there was a question on our actively managed ETFs. Just to note, there was no change to the fees on those actively managed ETFs. When we, when we changed them from ETFs to actively managed ETFs, the fees did not change. They still have the low uh, fees that they have always had. Evan said, it says, is it time to move from the FANG to property and or Box Hathaway, or is reduced growth of FANG just temporary? So, Evan, I think it's important to differentiate between growth and uh, price return. We still think structurally that uh, the FANG stocks have fantastic growth ahead of them, uh, and that, that, that that growth is going to outperform the rest of the market. From a price perspective, though, in the short term at least, markets seem to have become you know, very, or well, markets were very bullish. They priced in a lot of that uh, forecast growth. And now it seems like even fantastic results from NVIDIA is just not enough to get the price return uh, to, to move sideways. So we think structurally, FANG is a great place to be. You still have phenomenal exposure to FANG uh, from S&P 500. You still have phenomenal exposure to FANG from the MSCI world because they are such big companies. I mean, Apple, the biggest, NVIDIA, the third largest. So those, those FANG stocks um, are in our portfolios regardless of if you're holding a direct geared exposure. We just think right now that uh, you're not going to get any additional performance from a return perspective out of, out of um, those FANG stocks. So they're likely to move sideways maybe in line with the rest of the market, maybe slightly lower. Uh, and so you know, we have switched out, out of that into S&P 500. Uh, so that's, I mean, we're just moving from uh, very focused US stocks into broader based uh, US stocks. Um, but you can also, as you suggest, Box Hathaway is a great uh, choice. And if you want um, a, a proxy for US value or US quality uh, versus just the index, um, uh, Property is something that we 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 are underweight, global property. We also underweight South African property. We still think, although the, the performance has been so terrible on both, uh, that they are looking attractive from a valuation perspective. But I think that there's still some structural headwinds to property uh, and we remain underweight. That as tempting as it may be to start to buy, uh, we just think there's, there's still this, the structural issues haven't, haven't uh, completely fed through into the market. Yes, there's certain sectors that are, that are, are robust, um, such as uh, your 
focus on distribution centers and, and uh, the, the uh, battery centers and logistics and, and, and others. But the commercial real estate as a whole is still, particularly in the US, is, is still facing some headwinds. And in South Africa, was it still rebalancing um, as everyone moves towards more online, more on, online shopping, more working from home, and just uh, you know, trying to get that structural excess supply out of out of the um, the system. Uh, Evelyn, I hope I answered your question, question on cost as well. Uh, Johan asks a great question. He says, is the fourth industrial revolution actively managed ETF still a proxy for the Russell 2000 small caps? I see the benchmark for the ETF was changed to a version of S&P 500. So, uh, Johan, great question. Uh, it is quite confusing because the uh, benchmark, uh, performance benchmark for both the fourth industrial revolution unit trust and the fourth industrial revolution ETF are the S&P 500 or, you know, or, or similar. But that's not how we've manage the fund is not how we pick the stocks or the themes or the sectors so it used to be um until a year ago both the unit trust and the etf uh in, invested in a technology universe and the technology universe was supplied to us by kensho and had a very small cap bias because it was just equally weighted we had the universe of technology stocks and we equally weighted across um, the kensho universe so at some point we had nearly 600 stocks um, in the unit trust and the uh, e the etf then a year ago, uh, we switched the unit trust, uh, which has always been active. Fourth Industrial Revolution has always been, been active. Yes, we used the technology universe from Kensha, but we had our own tilts and, and over, own overweights and underweights. We switched the, um, that, that portfolio construction basis from equally weighted, which gives you small caps, to a market cap weighted. Uh, and that gives you something quite similar uh, to, I'm not going to say, well, it is similar to the NASDAQ 100, but the NASDAQ 100 also has some non-tech stocks, so you know, those get, get left out of our, our index creation. So similar-ish to NASDAQ 100. So that was that was a year ago. So the, um, the fourth industrial revolution unit trust has been quite close to the NASDAQ 100, certainly more close to the NASDAQ 100 than the SP 500 over the last year, and it has outperformed that uh, quite nicely over the last year. And then uh, in the month of August, when the ETF, the Fourth Industrial Revolution ETF, changed from an ETF to an actively managed, actively managed ETF, we also aligned that to be the same as the unit trust. So that moved from an equally weighted um, portfolio construction method methodology, which is mostly small caps, to a market cap weighted methodology, which is close to the NASDAQ 100. Um, as I said, very similar to the NASDAQ 100, but there are certain stocks in the Na NASDAQ 100, <laughs> NASDAQ index which aren't technology, so those get left out, but 97% you know, uh, over that. So that's um, that's where we are standing now. Both the fourth industrial revolution actively managed ETF and fourth industrial revolution unit trust are managed on, on a, with a technology universe, um, but with a market cap uh, portfolio construction methodology. Um, Louise says, what is the outlook for the two Signia bond funds over the next two to three years? Will you ring the bell when it's time to switch out of these bond funds? Louise, that's another great question. Um, so the bond funds have had a phenomenal return over the last, last year, nearly 20% return out of the uh, indexed bond fund and now enhanced bond fund. And that's been a, the result of bond yields falling from sure, nearly 11.5% um, on the all bond down to you know, closer to 10%. And that has resulted in the price of those bonds going up. And so we've had not only a great yield of 10%, but also capital appreciation. Um, so that's led to a great return. We have uh, reduced our bond exposure uh, in our funds. So, so that, that has reduced, uh, not in the overall no, from the overall portfolios, that's that's been the same because we are still neutral South African bonds, but um, in our income funds, and we used to have quite a large exposure to uh, bonds, in fact, a very large exposure to bonds in our income maximizer fund, and it was close to nearly 100% uh, bonds in that fund. We've reduced that down to 50%, so we've cut that bond exposure by half in income maximizer. Um, our other income funds are a lot more conservative. Uh, both enhanced income fund on the life side and enhanced income fund on the unit trust side. They only at the most had about 10% bonds because uh, we don't like to put in too much duration risk, but we've taken that 10% down to zero. 
So on our uh, low risk funds and the absolute, ret absolute return funds, we've, we've reduced our bond exposure because we do think that a lot of uh, that the upside has uh, materialized. And we, you know, although we, we're neutral on South Africa and we're bullish in the medium term, you know, we could see some risks coming through in the um, medium term budget policy statement uh, in October and with a Fed statement in September. So we are, you know, we, we have taken some profit on that. So if that talks to ringing the bell, uh, yes, we have certainly switched out of bonds uh, to a large extent and into uh, income. And that said, it's important to notice that income, uh, while it's got a current fantastic yield of you know, nearly 11% enhanced income, that will be slowly falling over the next year as interest rates are cut. But interest rates only forecast to cut, be cut 1% over the next year, so that 11 should come down to 10, which again is in line with where bonds are right now. So you are getting uh, the same expected return from income as bonds, but with, with lower duration risk. And so uh, certainly we do like, like, that, uh, like that in our income funds. Switch out of out of bonds and into um, income. We also don't hold any property, SA property in those funds uh, and income funds. We do hold still some SA property in our balance funds, like we hold SA bonds, because that's important from a diversification perspective. But in the lower risk income funds, we have reduced bonds to to 50% an income maximizer and zero and an enhanced, uh, enhanced income. Koba says, uh, good morning. Do you think that emerging equities, China, India will raise uh, will rise when interest rates are cut later in September? Thank you. So Koba, again, a good question. So although uh, there was no emerging market um, analysis done in that that uh, that bull steepening curve that bank credit analysts have done, traditionally when the dollar weakens, uh, emerging markets do do well. Um, and that's because emerging markets tend to fund uh, a lot of their debt and certainly their working capital in dollars. You know, so if you have to, if an emerging market company has to um, put down money to secure a supply of iron ore, uh, they have to do that in dollars. Uh, and so the dollar, dollar debt forms part of their working capital. And as those costs come down, either through a weakening dollar, which immediately gives them, uh, pro pro makes that cost profitable, or lower US interest rates, again, it's, it reduces the cost of that working capital, which is good for emerging market earnings. So yes, traditionally emerging markets do do well uh, in a interest rate cut environment. That said, we do th still think that we're not at the, you know, we're not going to see interest rates cut as much as markets expect. Uh, and we do still think that there's uh, some headwinds from, 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 from uh, falling manufacturing PMIs, uh, from potential trade, trade wars and tariff wars being announced. Uh, and that China, most importantly, is going to hold back in emerging markets. And India, as well, seems to be facing its own headwinds, starting to slow. Uh, Mexico is also starting to slow. So I think there's there's now uncertainty about friendshoring and onshoring, uh, less investment into that. You know, will the U.S. force uh, you know all manufacturing to move to, move on move onshore as opposed to friendshoring? Uh, so we are seeing a slowdown in um, in emerging markets as a whole uh, at at the moment. Um, so. Yeah, we are not not expecting emerging markets to outperform even as interest rates are cut uh, in September. Peter, the great question. You say, how can I, as a retail investor, get maximum exposure to U.S. consumer staples? We don't offer that as an ETF or unit trust um, at the moment. So it has been. Uh, we do have those four themes in our in our global balanced portfolio. So every single uh, Signia fund that has global equity has exposure to those four themes, um, but we don't actually offer that separately as an ETF or unit trust yet. Uh, U.S. consumer staples. It's definitely something we're thinking about about launching, um, but we don't uh, we don't offer it directly. So for the moment, um, you can either if you want, if you, you could get invested, you could invest in Berkshire Hathaway as a proxy, um, or you could uh, invest in one of the, the, in the Sig Signia Skeleton International Equity Fund of Funds, which is a global equity fund and has you know, a decent exposure to consumer staples. But we don't offer that theme as, a, as, a, as an investable ETF or an um, unit trust at the moment. Uh, there's a question about, can you buy the skeleton fund range on the JAC? So we don't offer the skeleton fund range as ETFs. Uh, as of yet, skeleton, the skeleton balanced range are only offered as unit trusts. 
So you do need, you do need to uh, buy them through our platform at the standard 3 p.m. pricing. Uh, we have considered launching them as ETFs, but it doesn't. we haven't seen a huge amount of demand uh, for those to be launched and listed um, on the, the JSE. So if you, if you, are, if you think there is demand, uh, please email us and uh, show us that you are keen, and we can certainly reconsider uh, launching an identical version of the Skeleton Balanced Range Unit Trusts as actively managed uh, ETFs. Serena asks, is the S&P Global 1200 too broad? Um, uh, are you talking, uh, sorry, Serena, I'm not, are you talking about its exposure to consumer staples? Um, S&P 1200 is um, an ETF that we offer, passive ETF, very low fee ETF. Uh, it's a, basically a very similar exposure to MSCI World ETF. It gives you broad exposure to the entire world market cap uh, weighted developed market exposure. So again, that's 65 to 70 percent uh, US exposure to Europe, exposure to, to um, Japan. Uh, S&P 1200 Global also has very small exposure to emerging markets, about 4% which SIGWorld doesn't, but roughly uh, very similar to SIGWorld. Yes, uh, there is exposure to S&P 500 and Skeleton 70 for Anonymous. Dave says, what is our view on the OSI fund? Uh, Dave, uh, the OSI fund has been uh, disappointing uh, from a performance perspective. Uh, there's no, no, no doubt about that. But the underlying companies are actually doing quite quite well. So the issue has been because interest rates have been high, uh, companies haven't been refinancing, and you only get a change in price when the companies refinance because then you get a new mark to market for the value of the company. So we've had uh, because financing is expensive, we haven't had any refinancing, uh, and that's kept the price low. And I think. That's going to probably be the same for the next 12 months uh, until interest rates start to fall significantly in, in the UK. Um, but when you look through the underlying companies, uh, you know, we are still seeing some decent movement moving forward uh, on those the, the growth uh, of those companies. So uh, a bit of a disconnect between valuation and uh, growth, um, but it will be a little while before that disconnect actually starts to converge, unfortunately. Mark says, uh, if you have a reasonable sum of US of dollars and GBP and cash, what would you recommend to invest in order to protect value and growth? Um, Mark, that's a great question. Um, so you're talking about uh, offshore money, dollars and pounds uh, in cash. What would you recommend to invest to protect value and growth? So it all depends on your time horizon. It all depends on um, your your risk profile, um, but you, you, you know, roughly you, you want to say a 60, uh, 40 equity bond split, and you're going to keep that. You know, obviously, you are already in, in dollars and pounds. So that would be the starting point for any global balanced uh, fund is a 60, 40 split. And uh, you, know, you want to be diversified as well. So it uh, all depends on how much specific risk you want to take in any of our themes versus how much diversified exposure you want in just an MECR world or an SP 1200 global. Uh, Peter says, uh, so there seems to be no way to access your small caps uh, from Cigna now. Yes, correct, Peter, at the moment, since we've changed the fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, ETF to, to a market cap based portfolio construction, we don't offer a small cap um, a fund uh, for you to invest in, a US, small cap US fund. Louise says, uh, question one, in light of Signia's continued asset swap capacity constraints, can we please get a JSC listed offshore equity focused ETF, which is a total return ETF to solve the problem of having to reinvest dividends ourselves? Okay, J Louise, thank you. That's that's good feedback. Um, our, our ETFs are price ETFs, uh, not, not cumulative or reinvesting ETFs. And we do pay dividends. Uh, you know, some clients like dividends because uh, they like to spend the money. Some clients prefer to keep the money uh, invested. Uh, so it's definitely something we can look at. Uh, question two, um, uh, can asset swap capacity not be managed at an individual level instead of collectively? Uh, we generally do do that, uh, Louise. We, we, we cap every uh, person at the same level. It's at 40%. Um, 
and certainly on new investments, you know, we can manage that 40 split uh, quite quite well. I see what you're saying that if you're an existing investor and it's been capped, it's uh, you're saying it's unfair because you have excess domestic. Um, certainly, some that uh, we can look at, but I think going for, uh, the safest thing to do once we have this cap in place, because otherwise it also becomes a becomes a problem, is is managing that on a on a balanced view. So you know, in future future flows, 40, 60. 40 offshore or 60 domestic can can make that uh, fairer uh, rather than individually looking at, at uh, what you have. Otherwise, it's going to force us further away from uh, where, where we are right now, unfortunately. Uh, to, a question from Anonymous saying, will two-part system withdrawals from pension funds have an effect of large equity sell-offs uh, by these funds? So that's a great question. Um, so it all depends on how much money is withdrawn, as you saw the Saab said between 40 billion and 100 billion, and then how quickly is that money withdrawn, Saab assuming that's all in the next three months, uh, and that will then de determine exactly how much liquidation needs to happen uh, on the funds, and then it all depends on how people liquidate. So from our perspective, we will liquidate according to our models, so we're not going to say, oh, well, we're going to pay everything out of cash and then go overweight bonds and equities, because that is, that's not fair to 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 the existing portfolio. So the the sales are split by a model. So if it's a 80% equities, 10% bonds, 10% cash, we sell 80% equities, we sell 10% bonds, we sell 10% cash. Uh, and that equities are probably 40 offshore, 40 local. So each gets uh, gets sold according, which on, on the one hand is fantastic because it means you are spreading the sales across all asset classes. You're also spreading the sales across global and domestic. So it definitely spreads the load quite significantly. Um, which means there'll be less impact. Of course, the big question is some of this, the uh, the less liquid sales. So what happens to um, SA property uh, if, there, if, if, if everyone wants to sell that and there's not much liquidity there? Well, that we could see some asset classes less liquid, less, 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 sorry, less liquid asset classes could sell off more uh, if there are forced sales. Or on the other hand, you could find that um, you know, people say, oh, property, uh, there is no liquidity, so we aren't going to sell from that, and we're going to go overweight property. So again, it depends on how people uh, want to trade this. So we are watching it very carefully, and we are monitoring liquidity, we are mo monitoring bid offer spreads, we're, we're monitoring performance. Um, uh, we are concerned that there may be some, some forced sales in some of the less liquid segments. Um, and uh, certainly from a tier A perspective, if we see anything being oversold, we may overweight that sector because it should hopefully be a short-term impact. But we are, we are watching it opportunistically. Uh, John says, uh, thank you, John, but he says, are the component shares the NASDAQ 100 included in the S&P 500 and the MSCI 600. So certainly from a large cap perspective, the top 10, uh, John, of NASDAQ 100, top 10 of uh, MSCI World, top 10 of S&P 500, top 10 of S&P Global 1200 are all very similar. When it comes to, once you market cap weight those stocks, you know, they're all going to different weights, but you, your, your top five's all gonna be NVIDIA, Apple, Amazon, uh, Google. They're all gonna have, have um, a pretty strong exposure to the, to the top 10 or top five in your portfolios. John says, with regards to that actively managed ETF healthcare fund, where can we see the components and make it for the new actively managed ETF or is it similar to the Sol Active 150? So John, the actively managed ETF is now very similar to the unit trust. So you can look at the unit trust fact sheet. The fact sheet will be updated uh, when the new fact sheets come out. It still has a very strong exposure to the sole active 150. So it's still it's still um, in about 90% uh, sole active 150 with the other 10% uh, with our exposures to our, um, our, our themes of uh, the semi semi-glutides, which we think will continue to do well. So that's Nova Nordisk and Eli Lilly. So those, those have overweight, overweights um, in the portfolio. Uh, the unit trust also has some OSE, a small allocation, whereas the ETF can't because it uh, there are liquidity constraints. So you know, there is a slight, like a 2% difference in the actively managed ETF to the unit trust because of that. But otherwise, very similar, roughly 90% sole active 150, roughly 10% uh, to uh, thematic uh, views on sem sem semi-glutides. Okay, nearly done, two more questions. Uh, what are your thoughts on the SVO 100 with the possible recession hitting the US next year? It has, gr it has had great increases over the last five years. 
is this still on the horizon? Was there a possibility of plateauing? Uh, we still think that on a relative basis, the S&P 500 is the place to be. It's still got the strongest um, tailwinds. And if there is a recession, the dollar will strengthen and people will run to safety and that safety will be the S&P 500. So I think, you know, our, even you know, whether the recession happens or doesn't happen, uh, our positioning of being overweight the US is still the right one um, in terms of S&P S &P 500. Uh, and uh, last question, living annuity investments in skeleton balance, 70, good place to be, a uh, question mark. Uh, that's, uh, it's, it all depends on your risk profile, it all depends on your, your time horizon. Um, but certainly if your drawdown is 2.5%, um, that is generally met by the payout of the bonds in the fund and of the, the equities in the fund, the dividend yields, the coupons. So depending on your risk risk profile, and so I'm not going to, I'm going to give you, a, it depends, but depending on your risk profile, it actually sounds like an, an appropriate uh, an appropriate uh, place to be for such a low drawdown rate. It's the lowest you can get in a living in your T, 2.5%. And that's it from a Q&A perspective. Thank you everybody for joining. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate the confidence that you've shown us. I appreciate you investing in the Signia funds. Uh, I hope you are pleased with performance. We certainly are, particularly the skeleton, skeleton balance range, uh, doing phenomenally. Um, and thank you to Nikita for, for being with us today and showing us uh, the uh, benefits of being invested in that fund. Good luck for September. Hopefully it's not as volatile as, as uh, it has been historically. And we will see you in October for the next update. All the best.